Father, I thank you for being our God, for loving us, for giving us the opportunity to share and learn your word together. We pray, Jesus, that you would empower me to speak it as you would. We pray that you would empower me to speak it with love, Father, that I will speak it knowing that I will have to give an account to you for how I've spoken it, and that we should also hear it as people who know that we'll give an account to you for having heard it and empower us to implement it. May you speak through me so that it will not be with human wisdom, but with the Holy Spirit in the name of Jesus. Amen. Today I'm going to be sharing with you from John chapter 13. And uh, I'm going to start from verse 1 to verse 20. And I have some lessons that I want you to get from there. And we'll dig them out from the various portions of, of the scripture that we're going to be reading. And let's get right into it. I'm reading from the NIV Bible. And any version that you have will probably do the job. So... It was just before the Passover feast. Jesus knew that a time had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. Now let's stop here and, and look at some things that have already happened. So this is the day of the Passover, and Jesus is about to... And actually has eaten his last meal, his last Passover meal. And now, verse 13 is something that I want you to take note of. Verse 3, rather, is something I want you to take note of. It says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This verse is very important because it shows us the position from which Jesus is serving. We see that Jesus is serving here from a position of security, not a position of insecurity. And this is something that I want us to get because it contrasts very drastically the way that many of us serve. Now, Jesus is about to do something that even the meanest slaves did not do frequently. This was a job that only the least of the least slaves did, which is to wash the feet of their masters and wipe them. And Jesus is about to do this kind of job to his disciples. Jesus is called Lord and teacher. Now the one who's called Lord and teacher is about to serve his disciples and he's about to serve his disciples and do something to his disciples that even the worst slaves did not do frequently. You have to be the lowest slave to do this for your master. So, what does Jesus preface it? It says here, Jesus knew that he had put, that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So, one thing that I want many of us to, to, to learn is that you know, we live in a world that people usually want to be validated by others. We want to be validated by others in the way we look. We want others to tell us that we are beautiful, that we want to be validated in what we do, that we've done a good job, and we want to be validated by what we say. Now, Many times this, this desire for validation leads to situations where people become dependent on other people for their validation and their encouragement and they don't seek their encouragement, the, the joy of serving from God. But Jesus here, before he does this, he says, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things 
under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. This reminds me of Matthew 28 and from around verse 18 when Jesus gives the great commission to his disciples. He says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Then he says, go and make disciples. Jesus served here from a position of authority and it teaches us also uh, to be able to serve from our position in Christ. We should serve because we know that we are God's children. We should serve because we know that we are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. We should serve not because we think that the work that we're doing for God is going to earn us righteousness. No, we serve God because we are already righteous. We know that God, through the blood of Jesus Christ, has bought us from the slave market of sin. And so we have received a righteousness by faith, which is a righteousness that is the same exact righteousness that God has. So now, when we begin to serve God, we have to serve God from that position of being a child of God, now serving the Father. Not doing that like some do, that you have to earn your salvation by your works, by doing many good works, you earn salvation. Also, we don't serve like many others do, who serve and then they are always looking for people to compliment them. If no one compliments them for the good work they are doing, they get bitter and angry and keep complaining that no one is recognizing what I'm doing, no one is thanking me. The Bible says we should serve as unto the Lord. That in everything that we do, we should do knowing that we're doing unto God. And so God becomes our center, the center of our joy. We serve because we know who we are in Christ Jesus. We serve not because we want to be better. We serve because we are already better. We serve because we are God's children. And as God's children, we are children of light. Children of light Do what the light does. God is light and God does righteous things. God God does these righteous things not because God wants to become better. God cannot be better. God does good because God is already good. Not because God wants to become good. And that's the same call that we as Christians have been called to. To live for God, not because we want to attain something, but that Through the blood of Jesus, everything that we need has been attained for us. I remember instances where young girls would get very angry and they they would get very depressed. And many of them would contemplate suicide. And some actually commit suicide because a group of boys have told them that the, the girl is the most ugly pr- girl in the world. And so this girl goes home and is very angry and says, well, if these boys have said I'm the most ugly girl in the world, then I don't need to live. And then some commit suicide. Some contemplate committing suicide. As a doctor, I've seen girls that come to the hospital having taken many tablets trying to kill themselves because of things like this. Because they expect their validation, their self-worth from others. Sometimes they expect from others because they have done something that they think that others should appreciate them for. And then when they don't get appreciated, they become bitter. Again, this point that I want to share with you, I want to have you see how Jesus served. Before Jesus does some of the meanest thing that he is doing to show his disciples something, he serves because he knows who he is. He knows that he is God. And he's going to do it. He's not trying to serve his disciples here. So his disciples will tell him, Oh, Jesus is a good master. He's very nice. He he washes our feet. He takes care of us. No, that's not why he's serving. So let's continue. Uh, We read and ended at verse 4. So I'm actually going to just read from verse 3 again. Verse 3, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. After he he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, that's verse 6, who said to him, Lord, 
are you going to wash my feet? Let me actually pause there a little bit and, and, and emphasize something again. So, I've been talking about how we should serve from uh, the position that we already have in Christ Jesus and not serve because um, we are trying to attain something. And I just remembered, you know, that many young women, if, you, if, you, uh, if you've heard many of them, they want to marry somebody who validates them, who tells them, oh, you're beautiful. You're very uh, nice. Oh, I like your this. I like your that. They are drawn to men like that. And sometimes people t say, oh, you've made my day by saying this. You've made my day by saying that you've made my day. You know that when somebody can make your day, they can take your day. If somebody and their validation has such an impact on you that it controls and determines your self-worth for you, then you are in their hands like a slave. They can do whatever they want to do with you with their mouth. Our joy, I'm emphasizing this, our joy should come from the Lord and the Lord should be the center of everything that we do. And we should not be, be centered or focused on getting other people to validate us. Even though the Bible is clear, we should encourage one another and build one another up. When that comes, it is good, but we should not focus on it. That's very crucial. Now, let's continue to read. So, he came to, P to, to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. This is very important because it is easy when you read this passage to get the surface meaning of it, to get the surface meaning that Jesus is about to teach his disciples here how to serve one another. That's true. But underneath this is a deep spiritual revelation that we need to get, which is why Jesus tells Peter here, Unless I wash you, you have no part with me. If it were just a matter of showing an example and it had nothing to do with anything f deeper than that, Jesus would not tell Peter that if I don't wash your feet, then you have nothing to do with me. By this, Jesus is saying that if I don't wash your feet, Peter, you cannot be saved. You are not going to heaven. You will go to hell if I don't wash your feet. That's what Peter, Jesus is telling Peter. If I don't wash your feet, you have nothing to do with me. There's, there are two revelations that we can, we can see from there and the, and the verses that are going to come. One, if God puts you in charge of a group of people, the service, the love of God that you show to these people is really how those people that are under you belong to you in the sense of God putting them under your church. Unless a person is able to receive fully service from somebody who God has put in authority over them, that person has a problem of rebellion. And let me explain this a little, a little further. If a mother has a child, one of the things that really makes the mother have authority in the life of the child is not just because the mother is the biological parent of the child. No. One of the things that gives the parent the authority to speak into the life of their child is because the mother has served and sacrificed. She's been awake in the middle of the night for the child. She's wiped the diapers. She's done the service. She's served the child. She's bent down and wiped the child's uh, 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 feces and taking care of the child. She's done mean and lowly jobs to take care of the child. Then, when she speaks, she has authority in the life of the child. Many of us who are put in position of authority to take care of other people and build them up for their good, we usually want to do what Jesus is trying to teach his disciples here, not to lord over the people. People who lord over people want to have authority without having served the people. God, say, God is teaching a different way. 
The way to have authority is not through lording over the people. It is actually through serving them. It is through going down and being a servant. The word you hear, servant, that you see all over the Bible, most of the time it is the word used for slave, doulos. And we need to be, what God is calling us here is we need to be slaves of the people that God has called us to serve. Not slave in the sense that they control us. We are God's slaves that have been put to serve God's people. So the ability to serve those that God has put under you and serve them with all your heart is how we become great in, in Christ. We do not become great by having degrees or standing on a pulpit and teaching. If I teach but never serve the people and have a heart of love and sacrifice for the people. I have zero spiritual authority. I, I, the teaching becomes nothing without love. It becomes like a, me being a resounding gong that makes no sense before God. But true spiritual authority comes through service and loving the people. So Jesus says here, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. So that's one of the meanings, the revelations that, that you can see in this verse. But another revelation, if you look at the typology that is in it, if you look at the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, we see the temple worship. And we see that in the tabernacle there was something called a laver. Now, after you enter through the gate and you go to the brazen altar, then you leave the brazen altar and you see the liver, which was a, ba a bronze basin that the priests would wash their hands and their feet before they proceed to go into the holy place. That was a type of something. The word of God is referred in the, in the scriptures as water. You, you, water is a symbol of the word of God. And Jesus in John 15, just a few chapters from here, from John 13, we see Jesus tell tell his disciples in John 15 verse 3 that you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. We Christians have been put in a place where we need to wash the feet of one another as Jesus is teaching his disciples here. We need to wash the feet of one another but not necessarily practically. Not only also by doing service to one another, that is important and that is also implicated here. But the other level of doing service for one another, of washing one another's feet, is washing one another's feet with the word of God. Let me, let me read a little further, then I will, I will explain uh, what, what I'm saying. Just hold that thought. So let's continue to read. Then, from verse 9, then Lord Simon Peter replied not just my my feet but my hands and my head as well peter's reply here again indicates the fact that peter knows that hey this is a spiritual thing if jesus does not wash me i have no part with him i am waiting for the kingdom of god to be part with him to be in heaven with him so if you must wash me wash my wash my whole body basically and Jesus tells him, no, you don't, I just need to wash your feet. So let's read. Okay, now we are reading from verse 10. Jesus answered, a person who has had a bath needs only to wash his feet. His whole body is clean. And again, and you are clean, though not every one of you. So we see here that for he knew, verse 11, for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said, not every one of you is clean. We know here that this clean is not referring to cleanliness of the body because the person who was not clean here is referring to Judas. Jesus is not saying here that Judas was not taking showers or that Judas was dirty, but that the word of God, which cleanses people, Judas had not received the word of God. Every other disciple had received the word of God and, be, and become saved, received salvation through the word of God that cleanses us from our sins. But Judas did not. So he was still dirty. Okay. From verse 12. 
When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. I tell you the truth. No servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. I am not referring to all of you. I know those I have chosen, but this is to fulfill the scripture. He who shares my bread has lifted up his heel against me. I am telling you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe that I am he. I tell you the truth. Whoever accepts anyone I send accepts me, and whoever accepts me accepts the one I s who sent me. So, like I was sharing before, there are two revelations here. The first one is the obvious surface one, which is Jesus is teaching us to be able to t serve one another. And the second one that we see is that we need to wash each other's feet in the Word of God. How do we do that? We need to speak to each other, as the Bible says, with hymns, with psalms, with spiritual songs. We need to speak to each other in truth and in love. We need to speak the truth to each other in love, even when it hurts. Because when we speak the truth to each other in love, we help encourage each other to grow in sanctification and holiness. And that is washing each other's feet with the word of God that we speak to each other. We need to maintain fellowship with each other and through our fellowship with each other, we need to encourage each other to grow. Because as Christians, we need to live in a way that we show ourselves to be the body of Christ. Living in fellowship with one another and in community. And when we live in fellowship with one another, we need to live in such a way that with others around us, we pour ourselves into them so that we make their lives better. We make it be easier for them to grow and become holy and serve the Lord. So we help with our lives to watch each other's feet. So we live in a world that is a fallen world. We live among fallen people. We live among fallen angels and the greatest of them is Satan. Who has demons with him. And we are tempted... All the time to live in a worldly way. We need to live being one another's keeper in such a way that when we work with each other, we try to pray for one another and speak words to one another to build each other up so that it becomes easier for each of us living in community with one another to actually stay away from sin, to actually ful fulfill God's vision in their life. So that becomes us washing each other's feet. And the Bible also clearly teaches that we need to speak as people who are speaking the very words of God, as oracles of God, so that we build people up. And Paul taught this, that our words should not be to tear people down, but they should, they should be to build people up. Everything we say should be to build them up, to build them up to grow in holiness, to build them up to grow in character, so that it is like our words are washing each other's feet. The word that Jesus spoke has already washed each of us. When we receive the word of salvation and we are born again, that word has washed us. But because like a person who lives in, in a farm where if you wash yourself, you still go around and the dust falls on your feet. Because we live in a world that is full of sin and we live among fallen people, we still do acts of sin daily. Even though Jesus has cleansed us, so we need to be growing in sanctification and that is equivalent to washing our feet and hands. And this was typified in the typology that I talked about in the temple worship where the priest will, after offering sacrifice, will have to go and wash his hands and feet. And look himself in, 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 in the... In the, in the in the lever, which was made from the bronze mirrors of the women. 
And so we as Christians need to examine ourselves in this in the word of God and speak the word of God to one another so that we can continue to wash wash each other's feet. So there are three lessons that I want you to get from this passage of scripture. I want you to live in a way that your security does not come from what people tell you. Your security does not come from what people don't tell you. Your security comes from what God has told you already. It comes from your position in Christ. The one whose validation is important that has an effect on us should be God. And there's something really important to say here. When we allow other people's word in our lives to become so powerful that it even exceeds the word of God, what God tells us when God tells us that we are wonderfully and beautifully made and we don't allow that to take root in us, but yet somebody who is a boyfriend or a father or a husband tells us that we're not beautiful and then we let that destroy us and then the word that that person says is more important and exceeds the word of God, we're committing idolatry. Simple. I... An idol is something that you set above God. See, we have never seen God. The Bible says we have never seen God. No one has seen God. Um, You have not seen God. I have not seen God. We know God principally through His Word and through the Holy Spirit. So, when we allow people's opinions to be greater than God's opinion through His Word, We are committing idolatry. We are setting those people higher up than God because we have made God's word to be lower than their word. It is as though in our lives, their word is high up there and God's word is is low down here. So we need to be careful about, about that and really live in a way that our security comes from God. The next thing that I I talked about is that our joy, our validation should also come from God besides our security. And as servants of God, a thing that I want you to note here as I conclude is also that many times God is going to have us do things that we do in obedience to God. And sometimes we don't even have positive results. Our confidence and our joy should not come from results. No, our joy should come from knowing that we know we heard the voice of God. God spoke to us and said in the scriptures that we should do this and that and we're doing that. Even if we don't see the the results that are positive that we expect to see, we know that our joy doesn't come from that. If our joy comes from those results, then we are now worshiping results. Our joy should come from God. So that when we, whether we have a good result or a bad result, we're going to lift our hands up and say, Father, we thank you because you are our God, because we love you, and we know that you are able to do it for us. So even if you delay, we will still trust you. Yeah.